The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on nonlinear finite element analysis of solids and structures. In the previous lectures, we discussed the general continuum mechanics formulations that we use in nonlinear finite element analysis, and we also derived some element matrices. In this lecture, I'd like to discuss with you the truss element. The truss element is a very interesting element and a very important element. It is important because it's used in the analysis of many truss structures and also in the analysis of cable structures. It's an interesting element to study from a theoretical point of view because we can use the general continuum mechanics equations analytically and derive directly the finite element equations, the finite element matrices corresponding to the truss element. Uh, these are derived in closed form. We can study these matrices and get some insight, some physical insight, what really these individual terms in the continuum mechanics equations mean. We want to study in this lecture the updated Lagrangian formulation and in the next lecture the total Lagrangian formulation. I mentioned earlier in a lecture that these two formulations really reduce to exactly the same matrices, provided certain transformations rules are followed. And for the truss element, we can actually very nicely analytically demonstrate that that all is true. So let us study now the updated Lagrangian formulation and later on the total Lagrangian formulation of the element. The assumptions that we are using for the truss element are that the stresses are transmitted only in the direction normal to the cross section. The stress is constant over the cross section and the cross sectional area remains constant during deformations. Of course, these first two assumptions here are those that we are also using in linear analysis. This we add now as an assumption, meaning that we really only consider small strain problems. We will consider large rotation, large displacement, but only small strain problems. Here we have a typical, typical element. We align that two nodal truss element with the x1 axis in its original configuration. And the element goes through large deformations, as you can see, and a large rotation theater. This node 1, originally here, moves there. This node 2, originally here, moves there. Notice that the length of the element is L in its original configuration, and it is also L in the configuration at time t. We use a Young's modulus, an elastic material, in other words, we assume for the, um, for the element. The cross-sectional area is A, and once again, we also use the fact that the element lies in the x1, x2 space. The same kind of derivation that I'm now following through could, of course, also be generalized to the three-dimensional case. In other words, where you have three axes, x3 being included. But all of the relevant information, particularly also the physical insight that we want to get from this derivation, is very well obtained by just considering element lying in the x1, x2 plane and moving in that plane. If we now look at the deformations of the element, we can see that at time 0, it was here once again. The displacement of node 2 is into the x1 direction, signified by this symbol here, time t, u into the 1 direction at node 2. Into the 2 direction, we have u2. The lower 2 means 2 direction, 2 of course being upwards. The upper 2 means no 2. The t once again means at time t. If we look at the uh, left node here, the node 1, that one moves this way and that way. We use, of course, a similar uh, symbolism to denote this movement. So this is the deformation from time 0 to time t given by these nodal point displacements. Now from time t, to time t plus delta t, we obtain an, an additional deformation, and that additional deformation is given by these displacements at node 2 here 
and at node 1 here. Notice that, in other words, from time t to time t plus delta t, the truss has moved from the red configuration to the blue configuration. Of course, note that, that these displacements are measured in the stationary coordinate frame. I made a big point earlier, in the earlier lectures, out of the fact that the coordinate frame remains stationary and the elements move through the coordinate frame. Of course, what we are interested in doing is to calculate, in the final element solution, these incremental displacements. We assume that the configuration at time t is known. We want to calculate the new configuration. That means we want to calculate these incremental displacements. And we achieve that by setting up the matrices, the appropriate matrices for the element. Well, to develop the appropriate matrices for the updated Lagrangian formulation, which I would like to discuss in this lecture, it is best to introduce an auxiliary coordinate frame. And that auxiliary coordinate frame is one that is aligned with one axis along the element. We introduce x1 curl and x2 curl. The curl always meaning body aligned coordinate frame. Notice that this is now the rotation here that the element has undergone. And of course, we really want to get the stiffness matrix in the x1, x2 frame, x2 of course being perpendicular to x1, not shown in this view graph but shown on the earlier view graphs. We know that if we have calculated the matrices in this curl coordinate frame, the body attached coordinate frame, we very easily can transform to the stationary coordinate frame. So let us now concentrate on finding the k matrix, the f vector, corresponding to this body attached coordinate frame. To do so, we look back to our continuum mechanics equations that we developed in earlier lectures. Here we have the basic continuum mechanics equation the principle of virtual work written for the updated Lagrangian formulation in the curled coordinate frame. See that curl there. And this was the starting point for the development of all the equations that we are using in the updated Lagrangian formulation. The linearization resulted in this equation. And we talked about this equation quite a bit, except, of course, we did not have the curls there because we were talking about the x1, x2, x3 uncurled coordinate frame. Now we are talking about this curled coordinate frame, so I simply put a curl on there. But otherwise, the, term, the terms are identical. Because for the truss, as I stated earlier, the only non-zero stress is a stress in, along the length of the truss, which acts normal to the cross-section of the truss, we can simplify this general equation to this equation. The only non-zero stress is tau curl 1, 1. The only strain that will cause stress, only small strain that will cause stress, is E curl 1, 1. Of course, a t on the left-hand side because it's referred to the configuration at time t. So this very general equation reduces to a much simpler equation already, as shown here. What we are out now to do is to evaluate these quantities here and there using the finite element interpolation. First, let us now look at what are some of the terms that we easily can identify. We identify this tensor term here to be simply Young's modulus, the stress term to be simply the force in the truss divided by the cross-sectional area, the volume of the truss is given here. Notice once again, the length of the truss is assumed to be constant. Therefore, we only consider small strain conditions. I mentioned that earlier. If we now use this information in the general equation, we directly arrive at this equation here. You simply substitute, and you will see immediately that these are the terms. Of course, what we now have to evaluate are these curled terms here. To proceed, we identify that the E curl 1, 1, the linear strain term, is simply given by the linear strain displacement matrix with a curl on it times the nodal point displacement vector. These are the nodal point displacements. There are four such displacements because we have two nodes and two displacements per node. Notice that I have a curl here signifying 
that we're talking about the curled coordinate frame, and there's a hat on top of that curl, as you can see here. That hat means these are dis the discrete nodal point displacements. The, this term here is evaluated via that term. Notice that we construct the BNL in such a way that this right-hand side is equal to that left-hand side. I mentioned that also in the earlier lectures for the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional finite element cases. Well, the vector of nodal point displacements, this vector here, is listed out here. Notice it contains the four displacements that I referred to earlier. And it, these are the, the displacements u curl 1, 1, u curl 2, 1. This upper one always denoting nodal point. The lower one and two meaning coordinate directions, similarly for these two terms. To evaluate now these terms, we recognize that the total strain, the total incremental green Lagrange strain, I should say, is given by this relationship here from our general continuum mechanics equation. The linear strain term is given here, and the nonlinear strain term is the rest. The rest meaning taking this total, subtracting the linear one, you are left with that one. And once again, these expressions are directly obtained by just taking the general continuum mechanics equations and varying the indices the way you want to see them varied. 1, 1 for i and j, if you, were, would, if you would refer back, and k, the k that I used earlier, goes over 1 and 2 in this particular case. In a three-dimensional case, of course, you would have k also going to 3. The variation on this term results directly in this expression. And we notice that this expression can also be written in matrix form. One row vector times one column vector. It is convenient to work now with this matrix form because we want to bring it into a form BNL transpose BNL. Before doing so, let us uh, identify one important point, namely that the displacement derivatives are constant along the truss. The reason for it is that we have only two nodes, and these two nodes can only specify a linear variation in displacement between the two nodes, meaning a linear variation between along the truss, and the displacement derivatives are therefore constant. For example, this displacement derivative is simply obtained by taking the difference in the nodal point displacements, of course in direction 1, because we're talking about 1 here, over the length L. So this is directly obtained for, uh, as u curl 1, 1. Similarly, we also evaluate u curl 2, 1. And you see the lower part here gives us that expression. Of course, the upper row here is nothing else than a rewriting of that equation. If you rewrite this equation uh, in matrix form, you directly obtain uh, this relationship. Or another check would be simply take this vector, multiply this matrix by that vector, and the upper part of that multiplication will directly be this result. If we now use this information, we directly extract the BL matrix which, of course, links up the linear strain increment with the nodal point displacements. Here, there is a small error. Let me just point it out. This bracket, of course, should go to there, because the um, B matrix, the B matrix, does not contain the nodal point displacement vector. It only goes up to there, because the E curl 1, 1 is equal to the B matrix times the nodal point displacement vector. Similarly, we can write now the variation in eta 1, 1 in this form. Notice that this part here captures this amount, and this part here captures that amount. This one, of course, we had already derived earlier. We just plug it in now. With this information, we can now directly develop the K matrices. We notice that the linear strain stiffness matrix is obtained from this expression. And here you have it. You simply substitute for these terms and obtain this matrix. 
much in the same way as we're dealing in linear analysis. The force vector, excuse me, the nonlinear strain stiffness matrix, that's the one we want to look at next, is obtained from this relationship. And we simply now substitute what we have derived for this term and directly obtain this, mate, this expression here. And what's under this blue bracket, of course, is our nonlinear strain stiffness matrix. Finally, the force vector is obtained from this expression. And you once again simply plug in and obtain this expression here, where what's under the blue is the force vector. The beauty is that we have started with a fairly complicated continuum mechanics equation. We have specialized it to the truss element, recognizing that only certain terms really need to be included or are included in this particular case. We have evaluated them in, fairly, in a fairly simple, straightforward manner, plugged in and obtained now matrices that can, of course, be analytically evaluated the way we have, to have it done. And now we can, in fact, even think about these matrices and try to physically interpret their meaning. We will do that just now. However, before getting into that, we want to get back to one point, namely that we have used so far a curved coordinate system. And as we mentioned earlier, we will have to transform from that curved coordinate system to the stationary global co uh, coordinate system. That is achieved by this transformation. Notice that the curved displacements are nothing else than a transformation matrix times the uncurled displacements. This transformation matrix is very well known from linear analysis. Uh, it simply transforms displacements from one coordinate system into another. This is the one that holds anywhere along the element for the continuous displacements, but it also holds at the nodes. So if we apply that relationship at the nodes, we directly obtain this transformation here. The curled displacements at the nodes are given in terms of a transformation matrix times the uncurled displacements at the nodes. Of course, we want to get the matrices, the matrix expressions, related to this uncurled displacement vector. Well, having obtained this relationship, we go back to the basic equations, recognizing that this part here is, of course, a linear. It's coming from the linear strain stiffness matrix. We substitute for u curl the uncurled vectors with the t's in front. There's a transpose appearing now here. This capital transpose has to be there because there's a transpose there. And what's in here, underlined in red, is the linear strain stiffness matrix of the element corresponding to the stationary global coordinate system. We proceed much the same way for the nonlinear strain stiffness matrix. And what's in here now is what we want to get, the nonlinear strain stiffness matrix corresponding to the global stationary coordinate frame. Same thing holds, of course, for the f vector. And here we have the f vector now in the uncurled global stationary coordinate frame. So it's really this part, that part, and this part, what we're using in our finite element analysis when we assemble truss elements into a global assemblage of truss elements. Performing the indicated matrix multiplications gives this expression here. In fact, this is the same stiffness matrix that we use in linear analysis when we have an element that is oriented at an angle theater to the global x-axis, the horizontal x-axis. So you might, might have very well seen this matrix before. The nonlinear strain stiffness matrix looks this way. Notice there is a TP over L, and then these terms here. Of course, it's also symmetric. And this is the matrix corresponding to the global coordinate frame now. We notice immediately that this matrix is, in fact, the same matrix that we already had evaluated in the curved coordinate frame. We will get back to that just now. The f vector comes out to be this. Let's now look at these terms physically. Here we have a single truss element pinned at the left-hand side. 
and a load R is applied to that truss at the other end. Of course, this direction of the load must be along the truss element. Or rather, the truss element aligns its direction so that it balances this load that is applied. The internal force is TP. TP balances TR. And TP, of course, acts along the truss element. Now, if we look at this node here, node 2, we notice immediately that this TR vector can be decomposed, or this TR can be decomposed into TR cosine theta along this axis and TR sine theta along that axis. P is acting here, and P can also be decomposed, as shown. Now, if we look here, we find, therefore, that the TR vector corresponding to the global coordinate system contains these two entries shown here, and the TF from our earlier view graph at node 2 was indeed simply this part. We notice, therefore, that TR is equal to T TF as shown here, or TR minus TTF is equal to 0. And that is, of course, what has to hold when we satisfy equilibrium at that node. So we have a nice interpretation of this F vector. And in fact, we can see that our arithmetic of getting that F vector is, has been correct. Let's look now at the KNL matrix, the nonlinear strain stiffness matrix. Let's, we already pointed out earlier that the KNL in the uncurled frame was equal to the KNL in the curled frame. And we can ask ourselves, of course, why is that so? Well, the reason is the following. Let's look again at this truss element pinned here and uh, we look at node 2, then we see that this vector here, which is by Pythagoras the component or the resultant vector of these two displacements, has this length. Now this length can be evaluated as shown here. Because the derivatives are constants, we discussed that earlier, we can write this, squared, this derivative squared plus that derivative squared, square root out of it, times L being equal to that. But then we recognize that what we are seeing here is nothing else than that term there. In other words, our nonlinear strain increment, which in this particular case we can see for the given displacement is constant and independent of the coordinate frame used. And that is really the reason why the KNL matrix is constant for any coordinate frame that we are using. Let us now try to understand what the elements in the KNL matrix physically mean. They, in fact, give the change in force, the required change in the externally applied force when the element is rotated. Here we have an element at time t, once again fixed at the left end, and subjected to a force tr. Of course, this force tr is balanced by the internal force tp. Let us now impose a displacement such that the element rotates about this point. We reach the configuration at time t plus delta t by imposing this displacement here which we denote u curl 2, 2. Now, in this configuration, a new force has to act on this element. And this new force, denoted as t plus delta t r, is shown here. Here we have the force t plus delta t r. Notice it is aligned with the element, the red element, at time t plus delta t now. The change in the force from configuration t to t plus delta t is given by this vector. And the element in that vector can be calculated by taking moment equilibrium about this point. We do just that right here. This is the equation of moment equilibrium about the fixed point of the truss. Notice that, of course, this displacement is small. 
And from this, we directly obtain that delta r is given as shown here on the right-hand side. And this is actually the entry for 4 of the K and L matrix. Now, the same information is also expressed here on the right-hand side, where we have written the delta r as the matrix product of K and L times u hat being equal to t plus delta t r minus t r. So this completes then our discussion of the finite element matrices of the truss element corresponding to the updated Lagrangian formulation. In the next lecture, we will actually discuss the total Lagrangian formulation of the truss element, and we will find that identically the same matrices are obtained as in the updated Lagrangian formulation. That will be a very interesting theoretical point as well as practical point. Let us now look at an example using the truss element. And the example is a simple one and yet quite practical one. We analyze a pre-stress cable. The cable has a length 2L. At the midpoint, a load of 2TR is applied. The Young's modulus of the cable is E. The cross-sectional area of the cable is A. We can model one half of the cable because of symmetry conditions as shown down here. Notice that, of course, we assume the transverse displacements to be small, the angle therefore to be small, because we assume that the length of the cable element remains the same. In other words, it does not change from time 0 to time t to time t plus delta t and so on. Using the UL formulation, we obtain directly from the general matrices that we discussed just now, this equation here, which gives the tangent stiffness matrix times the displacement increment equal to the externally applied load minus the nodal point force corresponding to the internal element stress, the internal element force Tp, of course, in this case. Notice that this is the equilibrium equation that carries us from time t to time t plus delta t. We would iterate on this, of course, introducing an iteration counter here. On the right-hand side, we have discussed all that in earlier lectures to obtain an accurate solution for time t plus delta t. But these are uh, some details that we don't need to look at now. For the moment, let's just look at this equation here in which we imply basically a simple step-by-step -step forward uh, incrementation of load without iteration. In practice, once again, we would actually iterate to make sure that we are satisfying equilibrium at the end of each time step. Of particular interest is the configuration at time zero, and there we recognize that the linear strain stiffness matrix up here is zero, and that all we have in terms of stiffness is the nonlinear strain stiffness. And that is expressed in this equation here. Notice that, therefore, if P zero is equal to zero, in other words, if there's no pre-stress in the cable, then initially it has no stiffness. Of course, this element here, let's look at it here at time t, this element here will increase as the deformations increase because Tp will increase. And this element here will also increase as the deformations increase. And in fact, this is expressed once more here. This total matrix will, in fact, be increasing. We say the cable stiffens as the load is applied. If theta becomes very large, in fact, if as theta goes to 90 degrees, the stiffness becomes quite large, and the stiffness approaches as theta goes to 90 degrees Ea over L. Now, this, of course, is rather theoretical because we assume in our formulation that the length remains constant and therefore that the deformations are small, as I pointed out earlier. Let us now look at the actual load displacement curve that is calculated for this particular truss, for this particular truss structure, which is really a cable structure, but we could look also at it as a truss structure because it is made up of, of two truss elements. Here we have the deflection plotted, and here we have the applied force plotted. 
for a particular case. Notice that L is 120 inch, A is 1 square inch. Notice that the maximum displacements we are looking at here are about 2 inches. So 2 inches over the length 120 inch means really small deformations. But notice the stiffening effect shown by the increase in the slope of this curve. We can actually show the stiffness matrix components as a function of the applied load. And this is a very interesting view graph. Here we see that at zero load, at zero load, the only stiffness that is there is given by K and L. We pointed that out already earlier. KL is equal to zero. As the load increases, K and L increases. As shown by the shown by the blue curve. As the load increases, also K and KL increases, as shown here. And the sum of these two curves, of course, gives us the red curves. And the red curve is the total tangent stiffness matrix at any particular applied force. We can directly read off the stiffness matrix, the stiffness corresponding to that applied force. Or more naturally, we would, of course, look for the corresponding displacement. In other words, at a particular applied force, we have a corresponding displacement. And for that corresponding displacement, we would have a stiffness. Of course, these curves are directly obtained from the expression that I just showed you earlier. Well, this brings us to the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, then, as I pointed out already, I'd like to look with you at the total Lagrangian formulation of the truss element and as I mentioned earlier, we will find something very interesting, namely that reducing all these complex continuum mechanics equations down to what we really need for the truss element, we will find that the same matrices in the total Lagrangian formulation are obtained as in the updated Lagrangian formulation. Thank you very much for your attention.